All right, hello, I'm Rich Folley. You're watching PBS Books coverage of the National Book Festival 2018. Our coverage continues right now with John Meacham. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Your book is The Soul of America, The, better, the Battle for Our Better Angels, uh, which is a, a book for our times, without question. Uh, and I, I guess my question for you as we start the conversation is, is this a book that you decided to write uh, recently, or is this something that was always in your mind as you're thinking about the challenges America's faced, yeah. or was it more of a response to sort of the divisiveness that you're seeing right now? I'm going to give you a classic Episcopalian answer. It was both. Uh, it was the impetus, immediate impetus, was exactly 12 months ago in Charlottesville uh, when the President of the United States had a hard time deciding whether he was on the side of white supremacists or those who were standing up for uh, expanding the Jeffersonian idea of equality. Um, it's informed by 30 years of journalism and history, uh, but I wanted to make the argument that we have been through darkness before. There are some elements that recur that are necessary in order for us to create a more perfect union as opposed to losing ground. And so it's at once addressed to the moment but I think the incumbent's name appears maybe three times. Uh, my hope is that people will read it and have a view of the country that is neither sentimental nor despairing, because I think that's where the truth lies, is it somewhere in between. Say, I mean, that's, that's the historian's salve, right? This idea that we've been there before, we're gonna make it through again. Uh, we've been through worse times. I know you, one of the people you, uh, you uh, that you uh, put in your two, Evan Thomas and Michael Beslas, two amazing yep. historians, two people that I look to for confidence that everything's gonna be great, you know, again, yep. and that we're gonna keep going forward. And yet um, there is this sort of perilous element to everything that seems to be happening all the time. Like we're, maybe it's the media, or maybe it's the way we, uh, we process information on social media, mm. but it seems like we're in dangerous times, whether you believe in the, what this president's doing or not, sure. In, in where you fall, there seems to be a, a divisiveness that I don't see repairing very easily. Well, I, I, I do disagree. Uh, I, I don't think that, that history is an uh, antidepressant. I don't think this is a literary, I use it as that. literary Zoloft. I really don't, because the point of history is not to say everything's going to be okay. It's going to say it, it is to look at moments that are divisive and... Uh, shaken by, roiled by perennial forces and tell the story of those moments. And when you look at it collectively, you realize that we, despite our issues, here we are in 2018, and what is our immigration issue? Our immigration issue is that people want to come here. So we've gotten something right from generation to generation, however slow, however bloody, however tragic that progress has been. Um, I'm not saying that it's absolutely certain we get out of this moment whole. I have a hard time seeing, though, that if we had been sitting here in the summer of 1932 or 33, I think you would be even gloomier in that question. Uh, this summer in 32, Franklin Roosevelt said that the two most dangerous men in America were Huey Long and Douglas MacArthur, because Huey Long could lead a populist revolt from the left and MacArthur from the right. Uh, the night FDR became president in March of 1933, uh, an aide came to him and said, Mr. President, if you, go, if you succeed in solving the crisis of the Depression, you will go down as our greatest president, but if you fail, you will go down as one of our worst. And FDR looked at him and said, if I fail, I'll go down as our last. So I, I, one, of the, one of the central contentions of this book is for us to guard against the narcissism of the present. And of course it feels particularly uh, real. It feels particularly fraught because there are issues. Why, why wouldn't they? Uh, but the historian's task, it seems to me, is to recreate the feel and the smell and the anxiety and the tension of those previous eras and then tell the story of how we either survived it or whether we lost ground. You know, part of history's allure is that it, it, it informs us, as you say, and on the other hand, as we, we take these pieces and parts of it and, it, and it feels like there are these dramatic moments, in some cases there were, whether it's uh, Churchill's speech to Parliament or it was Rosa Parks on the bus or it was these other moments that happen, right, that are yeah. like 
Joseph Welch, you know, it's like, sure. have you no decency, which gives you the sense, though, that there was immediate turn. When in fact, so often it's this slow, oh, wrenching Lord. change. The, 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 the long burn, uh, the long turn is the real, uh, uh, more, much more common story. Yes, Ms. Parks on December 1st, 1955, refused to get up. When did the Voting Rights Act pass? 10 years later. Are we not still dealing with issues of institutional racism and redressing the legacy of 400 years of slavery? Absolutely. There's something in the human psyche that reorders stories in a neater, in a neater way than they unfolded. And it's yeah. understandable, we have to tell stories. I bet the uh, Trojan War was a lot more complicated than Homer uh, led on. But history is not always A, B, C, D. It's often a big mix of alphabet soup. And it's sort of our task to go, it's a journalist's task in a, in a shorter frame and a historian's task in a longer frame to bring some order out of that chaos without giving the false impression that it was orderly. You can make order out of disorder, but I think you have to acknowledge that history is contingent and conditional and we don't know how things are going to turn out. One of the great points of the craft, one of the great uh, insights of the craft, is you have to put yourself in the shoes of the people who were there because they didn't know how it was going to turn out. And if you treat every moment as a moment like the one we're in, which is we don't, we're not exactly sure what's going to happen, then you're able, I think, to write the best kind of history because it has the elements of a suspense story because reality is suspenseful. We don't know what's gonna happen. It's more suspenseful when you go back and rewrite it as history, as pieces and parts, because you can take out all that wrenching. You can, you can basically take out the slow burn of it all, right? I mean, it just takes so well, long. Well, you have to, to get it between covers, yeah. yeah. Uh, but I think, I think I will have failed if I suggest that somehow or another things were easier in the past. Yeah. I think for two reasons. One is I think it does a disservice to the past. Do, if John Lewis were sitting here, would you want to say to him, you know, it was all over after Ms. Parks <laughs> didn't get up? I wouldn't want to be the one saying that. I would, I would think he would argue that it's not over. And it's not over. Um, so we do a disservice. And also we foreclose the possibility of that past to teach us. Mm -hmm. Because if we had this, vis this mythic vision that it was like Game of Thrones, you know, and it was good versus evil and it was well-defined, then we're treating it as myth and not history. And I think history has an infinite capacity to teach. It's not a GPS. You can't say, oh, I want domestic legislation, so how did FDR do the Social Security Act and here are the six things and that will happen. It's not like that, but it, it is a diagnostic guide. It does give you a sense of which uh, symptoms recur and what diagnosis might apply, mm -hmm. and therefore you might have a better idea about how to treat a problem. It's very interesting that we've adopted the language, the ancient language of health and applied it to our politics, the body politic, right. a crisis. The, the Hippocratic way of talking about crisis was it was the moment in a disease where you lived or you died. It was, it was that, and so we've adopted that language in part because previous millennia had always seen public life as even more essential than we see it now. Now it's consuming. FDR would have loved to have the mind share that the incumbent has. But in eras that were less advanced, in eras that were less secure, public life actually meant life and death from day to day. Yeah, I, you use the word incumbent frequently and you seem purposely uh, to it's, avoid- It's like Voldemort. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, I guess uh, as I think about this book and as I read through it and I saw all the amazing examples, all the difficult times, yes, but all the amazing examples of leaders that stepped into the void yeah. to help guide us or voices, powerful voices that, that were able to sort of rise above the, the, the din. Uh, you, James Baldwin's in here, FDR is in here. Uh, you have, yes, Rosa Parks. Alice you Parks, have, uh, uh, Rosa I mean, Parks. Marian Anderson is in here. I mean, you have all these yes. amazing people, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, all of these people who are, who stepped into that moment, uh, MLK, to guide us through these times, right? That like, 
And I think that maybe part of the reason that people have feel that this book is helpful is because that there were these moments where the like leaders stepped up and guided us through. You were at the funeral today for John McCain, uh, who has become uh, in the last few years, uh, a, a, especially most recently, as, as a voice for what is reasonableness, I guess. And, uh, no. and I think his death has a lot of resonance with people because maybe they felt like that there's something that was lost there because maybe there isn't another person that we know where to turn to for that voice. Do you see them? Where do you find them? Who are you looking for? Do you think someone new will pop into the fold? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, don't list, I don't get into the names of them, but you know, even McCain 30 years ago, you wouldn't have thought was going to become an emblem of, of statesmanship. Uh, he was always heroic and always fascinating. But what John McCain represented, I think, is he was an umpire in American life. He called them as he saw them at a moment when we tend to pick one team or the other. And we always think our team is right, no matter what the call is. And so I, I think we do miss that. I think that there's, uh, despite the fact that so many people participate in the death of reason, uh, nothing wrong with partisanship. We're supposed to be partisan. But reflexive partisanship is different than reflective partisanship. If you're on the other side and you get up, and I think before you even speak, Jesus, he's wrong again. I'm not... I'm not doing the right thing. If you get up and talk and I listen and, you, and I think, Jesus, he's still wrong, that's okay. I've listened, I've made my decision. But I bet 29 times out of 30 or something, or one time out of 30, you know what, you're gonna have a point. And, and that's the way the Republic move, moves forward. Um, I don't despair of statesmanship. Uh, I always like to say, you know, Fort Sumter was pretty bad. Uh, it's a miracle we've gotten this far. The Constitution is incredibly resilient, not least because it recognizes that we're driven by sin and appetite and ambition. The Constitution is the, one of the more Calvinistic documents you can imagine. It just says implicitly, you're gonna be passionate, you're gonna be greedy, we're gonna make it really, really hard for one passionate or one greedy faction to take over. And I think that system will out. It has survived armed conflict. It has uh, survived the building of a global superpower. It survived the uh, perpetuation and then the abolition of a fundamental economic element that involved human enslavement. It's involved in, in it's, it's survived incredible waves of immigration. It survived the extension of suffrage to the previously dispossessed. We, women have not yet voted for 100 years in this country. Not until 2020 Hard will to believe. be a century. Three years ago, gay Americans could not marry. 50 years ago, in my native region, I'm a southerner, we lived under functional apartheid. So you can't tell me that change doesn't happen. Again, it's too slow. But what about the idea of increment, like change happens and then it, it's sort of like a rubber band, right? I mean, you, sure. there's always like a backlash. And then there's, it's you progress, pull back reaction, and you progress, reaction, yeah. progress, reaction. Yeah. President Obama used to like to say, uh, things are never as good as we think they are when they're going well, and things are never as bad as we fear they are when they're going poorly. And I believe that. I think that's a, uh, I think that's a sound, historically-based judgment. Because every moment, yeah, let's play it. Let's do a little dork Jeopardy here. Give me a moment of you think of as a great American moment in American history. I would say uh, uh, the, the sort of America responding to the bombing of Pearl Harbor. I mean, the sort okay. of coming together as a nation. So America in World War II. Uh, exactly 69 years ago today, right, uh, the World War II began. Hitler invaded Poland on the 1st of September, 1939. 80% of Americans didn't want to get involved in the war. Why did we get involved in the war? Because we were attacked. Why did we declare war on Germany? Because Germany declared war on us four days after Pearl Harbor. Franklin Roosevelt didn't declare war on Hitler until Hitler declared war on us. He did so in a nation that was fundamentally segregated. He was reluctant to sign anti-lynching legislation. And within weeks of the attack you just mentioned as a great high moment in American life, he issued Executive Order 9066 interning Japanese American citizens who were no threat to the United States. Light and dark, mixed up together. 
I agree with you. It's the projection of power in World War II is one of the great um, stories in the history of the world. But it's shadowy. It's not unalloyed goodness because we were fighting for a liberty that we were not extending to our own people at home. Yeah. That's there's, history. There's no question. As a historian, as someone who has this in your head, as someone who's able to sort of recite so much of this amazing book and all that happened. I don't get out much, that's why. <laughs> a lot of historians don't, but you do actually. And, and I guess that's what I wanted to bring up. I, I watch you oftentimes in the morning on, on Morning Joe on MSNBC, where you're responding to the immediate happenings of yesterday, yeah. oftentimes. Um, and then the next day you're responding t to yesterday. It's, it's an ongoing cycle. It doesn't allow you the distance that you have when you're writing yeah. a book like this. You have two different hats you're wearing. That's more journalistic, obviously. But yeah. how do you wear those two hats simultaneously when it's really difficult to surmise what's going down in the immediate aftermath? Well, this will be a very self-serving answer, but I believe that the two hats inform each other. I think that by being part of what Justice Holmes called the passion and action of the time, I know in my own work in, in, in the books that it gives me a better sense of what it must have really been like to be in a, in a given moment. To, to have been a member of Congress in 1939, 1940, with isolationist sentiment and knowing you really needed to get involved but your voters didn't want you to and Roosevelt was being a little squirrely. That hour to hour, day to day reality was their reality. And yes, it's different because of the internet. Yes, it's different because of cable, but it's a difference of degree, not of kind. So I think being part of the daily tumult uh, is, helps me recreate previous eras of tumult. Uh, on the other side of it, I think that if I have any value to add, and that's in the eye of the beholder, it's that I can say, you know what, before you set your hair on fire, remember FDR had to deal with this, or Lyndon Johnson had to deal with that. Now, I do get in trouble when I go back to, say, John Tyler. Then, <laughs> then people get a little nervous. Yeah. Uh, tip a canoe and Tyler, too. Exactly. Hey, remember, there you go. Right? There you, you know, go. But... And tip or tip a canoe barely <laughs> made it. Uh, didn't make it very long. I, I, I believe that uh, the two things complement each other as opposed to oppose each other. Let me play the I game hope. you just played with me. What, are the, what, do you, what do you think is one of the high points, is that one of your favorites that you wrote about that inspires you as you think about what's happening currently? Lyndon Johnson and civil rights. Uh, when he went on the ticket in the summer of 1960, you would not have bet that this would be the man who would finish the work of Lincoln. Bobby Kennedy tried to bump him off the ticket. They thought he was uh, too much of a white Southern segregationist. Uh, he took the fact of his national election quite seriously, delivered a speech on Memorial Day in 1963 at Gettysburg. Imagine the pressure of speaking at Gettysburg, in which he said, you know, we keep saying the, the, the Negro in the language of the time should be patient. We can't be patient about fundamental liberties. And how much of that was politics of the moment and how much of that was really in his heart, do you think? Because he, he was a pragmatic pol politician, sir. I think as ever, it's both because he wanted to be president and to be president, you needed to, in, in the Democratic Party, you needed the Northern liberals to sign off on you. But he was also making an incredibly, to my mind, courageous political move because he risked losing his whole base, which ultimately he did. The South became a Republican bulwark in the wake of the Civil Rights Movement, which he knew. He said when he signed the 64 Act, I just handed the South to the Republicans for a generation. He was wrong, it's been almost three. <laughs> um, the night he became president, the day President Kennedy was murdered in Dallas, he said, I'm gonna pass the Civil Rights Bill without changing a sentence. And an aide said, can't we wait till after the 64 election? And Johnson said, well, what the hell is the presidency for if not to do the things that other men might not? And because Johnson was so flawed, because he got so much wrong, I'm even more struck when he got something so right. So imagine uh, President Trump in a Republican or a Democrat dominated or a Democrat held House, perhaps even a Democrat held Senate. This is a pragmatic politician as well. 
Maybe. Do you see him um, fighting against the tide or actually starting to, I mean, oh. we're, we're deep in it now, but like, I wonder what a different president he would be in a, in, in a world where he can't get everything that he wants. Never say never. I, I must say uh, people have lost a lot of money saying that after X, he will become more conventional or, uh, oh, it'll be after the convention. Oh, it'll be after the election. Oh, it'll be after the inauguration. Oh, it'll be after the... He, he's sui generis. Uh, I, I take your point. I mean, uh, Bill Clinton became a better president after the Republicans took over in 1994, uh, for Contract instance. with America. Uh, yeah. And uh, President Bush, George W. Bush, had a, very, had a pretty interesting, good couple of foreign policy years after the Democrats took over in '06. Um, so I, I, there is a historical pattern here. I just think that, that the incumbent is, is so devoted to this idea of politics as constant strife that the idea that to placate a Democratic House or that a Democratic House could somehow pull him toward conventionality in some way, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet the mortgage on it. And I think he's going to have to deal with... Uh, a move to impeachment. I think we're going to have to wait for Director Mueller's report. Um, uh, we're not going to hear anything else, I think, until after the midterms. Uh, but it wouldn't surprise me at all in January, February, March to have a, uh, a political conversation totally consumed by an ongoing conversation over the Russia issue. Yeah, I think we all better batten down the hatches for that. Yeah. Br mean, brush, brush up on your Cold War analogies. <laughs> in, in the meantime, though, John Meacham, your book, The Soul of America, it's going to last well beyond this president. This is a book that will inspire us for years to come. Uh, what I love about history is that it, it, is, it does address the moment, but it lasts. And what's in this book is something that we'll be using for a long time. I really appreciate you being Thank here you. today. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks so Good much. Fun. All right, everybody. We're still not done. Stick around. We have more to come here at the National Book Festival 2018. I'm Rich Fowler. You're watching PBS Books. I think it's a love affair with books. People are having conversations, and they're reading, and they're voting, and they're sharing with each other. And that was the whole point of this. I think this is a great thing that PBS is doing, and the whole concept of Let's strike up a conversation about books. To Kill a Mockingbird. The Little Prince. The Chronicles of Narnia. I think it's a phenomenal concept, and I'm thrilled to be part of it. I really want to vote for this, 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 and this, and it's saying, well, luckily you can do that. I thought that was one of the most ingenious things, that people are allowed to vote for more than one book at a time, because after all, who can choose one book? <laughs> it's such a solitary thing to do, reading books, and then you watch a show like The Great American Read, and then suddenly, you know, you're watching people talk about their favorite book, and you're like, oh my goodness, I felt the same way. You know what's great about this list is it's really hard to pick a favorite. There are books on this list that have mattered to me at different points in my life. And if, if you had asked me at different points in my life, I would say, this is my absolute favorite. You know, we've all done our Jane Eyre, our Pride and Prejudice, a Tom Sawyer, Charlotte's Web as a kid. And then there's some new ones. You know, I was really surprised that Fifty Shades of Grey made the list. Fifty Shades of Grey, really? But it makes sense. It, you know, this was not a, a stodgy group of people saying it has to be a classic. It was people voting. I get it. I get why that would make the list. As long as there are people that love books, I think there's always going to be a great place for great novelists and great stories. Memoirs of a Geisha. Looking for Alaska. Little Women. Vote for it as your favorite. We want people to read books on the list, books off the list. Share your love of reading, and let's inspire everybody to pick up a good book. I'm excited to see what this number one book is going to be. I cannot wait to be a part of making that decision.